advice for the indication by Reverend Bob Roach, pastor of the First United Methodist Church. Thank you for this invitation and for I'm thankful that we can still pray before local government meetings. So let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon all who are gathered in this council chamber on this eve of the day spring 2013 burst upon us. May our honorable mayor and members of the city council gain a glimpse of your mind, your will, and your heart for this very sacred and beautiful corner of your magnificent creation. And Creator God, tune all of our lives and our spirits with the rhythm of your design for life here in the days and weeks and months and years ahead. And may your sacred power, peace, and presence guide and grace all people here of all creeds and color, all ages and stages of life, and throughout our home of Hickory, as we pray in the name and spirit of the one who offers life abundant and eternal. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. First on tonight's agenda, we'll have our special presentation. I'll call on David Pack. Good evening. My name is David Pace, and I'm representing the Hickory Business Development Committee. Too often, in our rush to attract and develop new business opportunities, we overlook those companies which sustain us. One of these companies is Alex Lee Incorporated. Alex Lee Incorporated, which includes both Merchants Distributors Inc. and Lowe's Foods Inc., was founded in Hickory in 1931 as a grocery supply company by Moses George. His philosophy was if your customers are successful and your suppliers are successful, you, are, you will be successful. Over the past eight decades, using this philosophy, Alex Lee Inc. has grown to a regional powerhouse, including over 1,900 employees in the Hickory area. They also are highly, <coughs> are, <coughs> excuse me, they also have invested heavily in the community including two of the North, Carolina, North Carolina's largest food banks, as well as a locally grown produce campaign called the 10% Campaign. For this reason, the City Council and the BDC would like to recognize Alex Lee for their positive impact on the Hickory community. And we have Brian George and Kimberly George of Alex Lee here to accept the award. themselves in a professional 
and courteous manner and that there be no personal attack against any group or individuals. And we also ask that members of our audience respect the person at the podium and that there would be no outburst either in favor or opposed to the person that is presenting their topic. Uh, lastly, we would ask that uh, we would say that council members will not answer questions. However, at the conclusion at the person of the conclusion of the person's presentation, if there are any questions or concerns, uh, we will direct those to the appropriate staff and ask that they respond in a timely fashion. So the next I would just ask if there's anyone that would like to speak and uh, if so, uh, let's say I've got one here that's got that's wrote down. David Crosby of seven thirty one tenth street drive northwest has signed up to speak. Is there anyone else besides David? that is requesting to speak tonight. Okay, then I'll call upon Mr. David Carter, please. Mr. Berry, Mr. Crone, council members. Uh, I am nervous, so it's going to take me a minute to calm down. Uh, being professional, I'm not sure I can do that. Being courtesy, I will be that. I have to be very courtesy to everyone in this room. Uh, what I wanted to talk about tonight, I mean, y'all are about three weeks ago, long about two months ago, it was brought up about the audio visual uh, project that we're looking into as a city to do that. And I come to you tonight thinking about this thing for weeks now as to why we want to move that way. We have a group of people here tonight that may be, I don't know, 70 people at the most. I heard Sally bring up one time at the meeting, excuse me, Sally, I heard Mrs. Fox bring up one night at the meeting about are we going to put a curtain up so that people won't see how empty our place is. Uh, and as a businessman, I thought about this. We own a business here in Hickory on 3rd Avenue Drive. And for me to spend $16,000 in my business, I think about it a long time. Uh, I just have a hard time with that. When I figured 16000 and you may get 300 people watching something, we don't know if it's going to be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, that's a lot of money. That's probably less than one-tenth of one percent of the population in Hickory. And I just have a hard time seeing us spend that kind of money when we got businesses that are moving out. We've got a square downtown that's moving out. I think there's a lot of ways we can spend money better than that. And uh, I talked to some of my neighbors, and actually they laughed at me when I told them what they were getting ready, what the city was thinking about doing. Uh, I don't take this as a laughing matter. I think it is a serious matter. And I know I'm speaking before it's being brought up and everything else, which I don't like. But I'm one person. You know, I'm a taxpayer. I'm a resident of Hickory Hill for 15, 16 years. I like Hickory. I don't plan on moving from Hickory. If y'all televise this or not, it doesn't matter to me. Because you probably never get in on TV because I'll never speak again. But anyway, I'm against it. I don't think we should spend money. I think if we go do something, let's put a tape in here. Let me on the tape and put a CD together and somebody wants it. Let them have it. Send it to them. Because it's not going to be live anyway. So we're looking at something that's going to be history by the time people look at it. So that's what I have to say. And thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Carlson, for your comments. Once again, is there is there anyone else present? That's desiring to speak tonight. Okay, there being no one else desiring to speak, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the regular meeting of March 5th, 2013. Mayor Pro Kim, I'm All in favor say aye. Aye. Motion was made by Mr. Seeger, second by Ms. Patton, and the decision carried unanimously. All right, motion to approve the uh, special joint meeting city council and aspiring spaces on March 5th, 2013. I Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, the motion is made by Mrs. Patton, seconded by Mrs. Fox, and the motion carried unanimously. Motion to reaffirm or ratify the second readings. 
I move uh, we reaffirm the high on second reading. Second. Okay. Motion by Mr. Lell, second by Mrs. Patton. All in favor say aye. Aye. And motion carried unanimously. Is there any items to be removed from the consent agenda? Move to be approved. Second. All right. Motion by Mr. Michael, second by Mr. Seaver. All in favor say aye. Aye. Carried unanimously. All right, we're down to informational items. Mr. Berg. Thank you. One item of uh, information for council this evening. That's the report of Mayor Wright's travel to the mayor's meeting of Governor McCrory, uh, sponsored by the uh, Metro Mayors, which the CBP is a uh, member of. And that was uh, March 5th and 6th. Uh, the report includes the meals, Milan University, and the Monument of the Monument. Okay. Uh, we have no public hearings listed tonight, so next on the agenda is the departmental reports, and again, I'll call on Mr. Perry. Thank you. Uh, the first departmental report, I'll ask uh, the city's administrative services director, Mr. Mike Vint, to come to the and present uh, the information about preparing the chambers, city council chambers, for how they're doing All right, thank you, Mr. Barrett. Uh, folks and guests, city council members, uh, Mr. Perry. Uh, since your last, well, not your last meeting, but a month ago on uh, February 19th, uh, and at your request that we as staff look into more further details of costs related to broadcasting uh, these meetings on television, uh, we have done so. We, as staff, have met with the selected vendors uh, that we would look to in working with and fine tuned some of the, the quotes that we had originally received and added. And, Attracted some things from those quotes. So I want to kind of go through those uh, that are listed out here. As far as some of the improvement costs, the, the first would be the audio upgrade, which would uh, encompass replacing the complete microphone system that's in this room. Uh, the system was placed or put in here, I believe it was 1998 or 99, about that time frame. And actually, before we had the request to uh, look into filming council meetings, we had already put out some uh, requests for, uh, for proposals on updating the microphone system due to some complaints we had with being able to hear and also in the audio recording. Um, but with that cost at $13,562, that includes uh, replacing each of the microphones at, at your desk, but bringing them a little bit closer to you. So really they would stand on a, on a base slightly to your right, about arm's length, uh, probably about 15 inches from the edge of the desk, slightly to your right, so you could have some space in front of you. Um, on the base of that microphone would actually be an on-off switch, so it'd be a little bit different than, we, than you're currently used to, or prior to speaking, you would, you would uh, just simply turn it on and, and after making comment, turn it off in order to help reduce uh, other noises in the background of the audio recording. The, uh, the other changes that would happen would be there would be a wireless microphone at the podium as well as at the court steps. Um, part of broadcasting uh, or, or filming council meetings would mean we would want to change the podium to be almost in this area that uh, the IT stand is at near uh, Auto Woman Patton so that if, if the footage were to be filmed from about the entryway so you could actually see the face of those who are speaking as opposed to you know, just catching you know, behind the person speaking. So with that, and, and some of the problems we've had with, with the cords uh, on that, we looked at a, a wireless microphone at the podium at the clerk's desk. Um, the only other addition uh, would, would actually be four assisted listening devices that, um, that would be uh, helpful for those who, who may need uh, assistance in the area meetings that attend the meeting too. Second on here is uh, the removal of the picture that, that, that is behind you. Um, and the subsequent sealing, patching, priming, painting uh, the wall, and, and that's uh, $620. And this goes along with the, the third improvement, which is up upgrading uh, some of the lighting. Uh, as we met with Charter Communications, they pointed out that, uh, that having more of a, a light cream colored uh, wall behind you without a picture would help, uh, would help avoid uh, the blending of uh, view all into that picture and be able to make a clear, crisp uh, view 
on the film. And what that would, what that would, uh, originally when we when we talked a month ago, we were thinking we would have to upgrade two rows of lights, not the lights directly uh, behind you, but this first row uh, and the second. And what we've identified is that we think we can up, we actually can do it with just those four lights. So we were able to cut those material costs down. Um, and you can see those costs there at $537. Um, the, the last item would be sort of having a blank wall behind you, adding adding the logo, and it would, it would look something like this. Um, so it would be a, above above the level uh, when you're seated above your heads, um, where whenever it's broadcast or even here, you can see the, the city's logo. Um, coming back to this, as far as actual filming, uh, we would be looking at working with an independent contractor uh, that works closely with, with Charter Communications, and uh, they would charge us $200 per meeting. So about $4,600 annually if we, if we base it on the typical uh, 23 council meetings per year. The, that, what that charge would include would be uh, getting basically a, a, wide, a wide view of, of, the, of the front here. Uh, possibly occasionally zooming in, but, but not a lot of zoom. We wouldn't have multiple cameras in here and, and those kind of things. Um, but the, it would also be getting the footage, inserting the names of those who are speaking. And you can see the history logo as well. Um, at the bottom, you have the name of, of who's speaking. And, and when someone has a digital presentation, it would be inserted into the, the footage um, during, during the film. Uh, these, these would be made available, it would not be live, it would be uh, within about 48 hours where the charter communications would broadcast on the government channel. Uh, no additional uh, <coughs> costs, and also it would be available on, our, on the city's YouTube channel, so that anybody can view it at any time they'd like on, on the web. A couple other things that we were asked to look into, some additional options, uh, would be if we wanted to upgrade the projector in this room. This isn't. This would not have a direct impact on filming or, or the footage uh, of, of council meetings. Um, uh, but having having the podium over here and, and, and looking at if we were to upgrade the projector, that would mean mounting it about this about this location uh, under the ceiling. Um, the projector we currently have is uh, is meant for a pretty close uh, location to, to the screen. Um, so to replace that and have a, have a little bit of wider view and a clear uh, visual of the, of the presentations in this room, you can see that cost is just a little over $5,400. The, uh, the other option that we were asked to compare this to is to compare it to putting up basically with large television monitors. Or, um, and with that, if, if an 80-inch monitor, if you put that in this same location, uh, you can see the price there at $4,469. And uh, if uh, we were asked as well to consider if there was a, a smaller monitor on this side and have visuals from both ways, um, so you could, you could see the cost is on that as well. Some of the main differences between a monitor and, and a projector, if, if, if we upgraded the projector um, so it was able to get a clear uh, crisp shot from a, a further distance uh, back here. Um, you you would the visual of a presentation, a typical presentation, would be fairly similar to what you see right now. It'd be a little clearer and brighter, um, and maybe slightly wider. Uh, but if if it's an 80-inch uh, monitor, uh, one thing that I, monitors are clean. They 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 uh, they're they're easy to work with uh, in, in 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 conference rooms and. And, and such, but one thing that, that would be that definitely did want to point out is that you would, the, if you're looking at this PowerPoint uh, right now, it would be about 20 inches um, less in, in height and in width, so it'd be a, a, a smaller image that you're actually looking at. Um, a, a typical PowerPoint presentation would not stretch the 80 inches of, of, the, of the monitor. Um, so a couple things to, to point out there. Um, basically, those are the, those are the, the costs that, that we've uh, identified in presenting, uh, being able to record and, and present on, on, the, on television and on the YouTube channel in a way that it's not very dark 
you know, or, or dim image where you could at least where it would be a clear visual and, and done in a, in a well-crafted way. Um, but uh, short of creating a production studio and, and uh, going that far. Um, but I, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Mr. Smith, I have a couple of questions. One, uh, you take the mural down, what will it do with the mural? Well, the mural is actually, the, the way I understand it, it is almost like uh, a painting on uh, wallpaper. Uh, I think would be the best, best way to explain it. So if it, if, if it comes down, it's, it's coming down and it's all it's all it's all it's We can't hear it. A couple of people at Kiwanis Club meeting asked me to try to preserve the mural. Another question is if, uh, do we need a projector and monitors or no. one or the other? It, it, it would be one or the other. If, if you were to consider those additional options, it, it, it would be either upgrading the uh, projector system so there'd be one focal point like we have now, just mounting a projector, or getting rid of a projector system and having, having one or two monitors on the wall. As far as the quality of the difference between the monitor and the um, projector, mm -hmm. which is the best. Quality, you're going to get very similar. The, the, the high grade projectors get an extremely clear visual from far distance, and um, it's going to be very, very clear. The, the, the monitors, in the same way, are, are extremely clear and, and, and crisp, and it doesn't matter um, with you know, lighting. It's not like you have to dim lighting to, to see it any better. Uh, the difference would be size. You're going to get a, a larger size of, of view with the projector than you will on the monitor. Um, some would probably argue that the, 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 the visual on the monitor might be slightly clearer, but I think they're pretty close. To, you know. Mr. Bitt, was there also some uh, advantage to the monitor as far as charter is concerned with the direct input? Yeah, one, it's a good question. We, we uh, because if we'd have this podium over here, so people are facing diagonal to you, um, it would, and, 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 we, and we move this station. We basically have the computer that's, that's connected to either a projector or a monitor um, over here near the clerks, which, which would mean we would plug it straight into the audio system so that if you were playing video um, or anything with sound on your presentation, it would come through the audio. But it would be the same um, whether it was a, a projector or, or a monitor. Um, some of the difficulty in this room, if it's a, if it's a projector, um, we, there's not a lot of room, if, if at all, um, in, the, in the walls, up in the ceiling up here. So you might have kind of covered cable coming across to get power to that. Um, with with uh, a monitor, it would, it would come through and go up where the lights are and come back down and hit over here. So um, both ways are, uh, are, are building maintenance that can be pretty creative when it comes to getting that. Uh, power to those items and we'll be able to do it. Um, but either way, both will be, will be connected to the audio system. Uh, so that we, instead of hearing it from the desktop, uh, it's as we can do Mr. Bennett, I really appreciate your, uh, all your information. You've done an in-depth job as usual. Um, and I appreciate Mr. Crosby. I have probably talked with 25 businessmen and to the one, no one is in favor of this. Um, I've sat at the Board of Realtors and they all ask, why would we do this? And, you know, and every one of us here has had, you know, in my family, one of my wife wanted a new ceiling fans. We've had them 20 years. They still work. You know, do we need, do, it comes a time when we say, is this really necessary? Um, you know, we just spent some time in Raleigh, all of us, you know, talking about the possibility you know, tax, we're looking at revenue. Um, I just don't think the timing is right. And I certainly, I'd like to make a motion that we delay till after the budget, our budget crunch and budget figures come in and we see whether we can afford to <coughs> see new seating plans. <laughs> you know, please tell my wife this. <laughs> um, but I mean, we've all had to do this. And, you know, Yes, it does take us into the 21st century, and yes, it, but, you know, the times are tough now, and, and business people are conquering down, and I just think this um, 
shows that we are not hunkering down. I'm sensitive technician, and I just have a comment. I have a little bit different take on this. Somewhere years ago, I read about the loss of sense of community and loss of by community or neighborhood people, um, and it had to do with air conditioning and television. People came home, they went into their air conditioned houses, and they turned on their TV, and no one interacted. Today we have cell phones and we have computers, and I don't know how many of us have been uh, in restaurants or with uh, other people who are engaged with their cell phones or their computers. And maybe I have a step in history, but I don't think that's the way for us to go. I applaud people that come down here. I may not always agree with everyone, and there may be people that are sitting in the audience that have never agreed with anything I've ever done. But I will give you an A plus for making the effort to come down here and be engaged with what goes on in your community. And um, as far as the mural, I've been in this council chamber off and on for 25 years. And I have heard so many folks from outside of this community comment on our council chamber because it, we have something no one else has. I also remind everyone that uh, at each of these meetings are available on audio and within a matter of, uh, I want to say hours, maybe 24 hours or more, uh, they're available on our, on our website, and the presentations are also uh, available with that audience. So that is currently uh, available as we speak. I, I asked my uh, father what he thought about it. He watches it over in East Tennessee. He watches it on television live. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about maybe having it videotaped and playing it there too later. He said, well, by that time I read about it in the paper. So he said, you can't do it live, you couldn't do it. So I agree. That's just him, but he's 80 some years old. He can't get out of it. What Ms. Fox alluded to, I see happening all the time with kids in high school and substituting, and they've all got their little TV sets in their hand. No doubt, for lack of a better word, you call them cell phones, iPads, whatever, iPods. But it's taken their attention away from the social aspects of living, eye contact, body language. They're not reading that anymore. So all they're doing is reading the way it's typed, and it's, it's they don't even spell words correctly anymore. They shorten them all. So it's hard to really understand what somebody means sometimes. If you ever do. There are any Frank Zappa fans out there listen to the slime <laughs> about stuff losing out from your TV set. He wrote that in 1969. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a few old people in there talking. This is a response to people that can't get down to the meetings, but I know I've heard of Mr. Seaver that it's over and done with two days later, but this, I agree, I would like to see us go through the budget process, see where we are with it, rather than just throw money at it and see how the budget falls. I would like to see us proceed on the project, but. Yeah, that just indulges me. Um, <coughs> Mr. Bennett is, is a little soft-spoken. Todd, did you hear everything? Yes. Gina, did you hear everything? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm just curious, you know, I've heard the comments that our audio is pretty bad, um, so you know, please. I, I think the audio is because I'm soft spoken, more soft spoken <coughs> than you are, and I think Ms. Fox also sometimes when we don't lean forward and speak, yeah. I think that's part of it. So we need to right. school ourselves until we decide to do something different. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to lean forward next year. 
<laughs> For those of y'all who don't know, we have signs in our microphones that says, in order to be heard clearly, please speak loudly and lean into the microphone. <laughs> is that what that says? <laughs> yeah, we can't see it because we all don't wear glasses. Yeah, we can't see it because we all don't wear glasses. Okay. Uh, is there any, any public discussion? <laughs> What's the most motion? I, mean, I would like to reiterate the motion. Uh, my motion is to delay the uh, vote and or discussion until after the budget process for this upcoming budget this year. And the date on that would be approximately May, approximately May June. We typically bring you a budget in May and vote on it in June. So we're going we're to have some time to and thanks to Mr. Crow, we will hopefully have some time for some input too. Right. And I would, I would encourage each of you, not only in the audience, but uh, your friends and family to discuss this and, and let us know how you feel about this particular topic. I think that we would encourage you to do that. Each of us would encourage you to do that. Okay, we've got a motion by Mr. Meissner and a second by Mrs. Fox. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carried unanimously. Mr. Berry, the next item. Thank you. Uh, next item I'll ask Assistant City Manager Andrea Surratt from the table to uh, present an item. I'll well, let her describe it next time. Sure. Mr. Berry, Mayor Pro Tem, members of Council, Mr. Crone. So this tonight is a, um, a request to purchase property, and it is at 159 12th Street Court, <coughs> Southeast. Um, and so what I want to do is just take you back through a few um, key points about our community development block grant program because that this is um, dollars that would come from the fed that comes from the federal government to um, the city of Hickory as an entitlement community to be spent um, on community development activities and so block grants um, all the dollars nationally have to be spent on really three different areas. First, um, an option is to spend it on, to, on projects that benefit low to moderate income persons. It also allows us to spend it on the elimination of slums and blight. And also, uh, as you approved earlier in your consent agenda, it allows us to do urgent repairs or have urgent needs met through those funds. And so, Nationally, that is really the, those are the three criteria for um, CDBG grant dollars. And through the low to moderate um, activities, and that has to be 70% of our CDBG program, which leaves about 30% to be able to be used for more like a, for more economic development related or non low to moderate income related projects. In the low to mod, um, category is then broken into four areas that we can spend that money on or where we qualify it in four different ways. So just as a refresher, first of all, if you have a, an area benefit, so such as um, a particular construction of a park or a sidewalk, something that helps a low to moderate income area and all the neighborhood benefits, that's an area that, um, that's a, a use of the funds that's appropriate. Also, um, if you had a a specific project that's related to um, a clientele group that has limited access or limited capabilities. And um, some examples in this slide list, um, you know, the construction of a community center or other services. That's also a potential area that um, dollars can be spent on. Low to moderate income housing is another activity. And, and that's a, um, a large portion of our, our program at this point. And so that includes the rehab of single family homes, down payment assistance, infrastructure improvements on publicly owned land. And, um, and, and all of that needs to be in that low to moderate income area. And finally, if there were um, projects that helped job creation, and retention in the low to moderate income area, then those potentially could be projects that CBD, uh, CBDG dollars, CBD, oh, I'm getting to see, <laughs> we need about the broad grant dollars can, <laughs> can cover. So all of that is to say that their census tracts uh, determine where those low to moderate areas are. And so we work with these standards that zero us in down into some block levels and neighborhood levels that then the dollars go toward those. So what we're finding is um, over the last 
few years, probably as a trend related to the economy, that we have fewer and fewer applications for um, rehabilitation dollars, rehab dollars to be used um, through our program. So um, years ago, you may have had more applications that came through the um, CAC that were for people wanting to rehab their homes and they access those dollars. And we just have fewer of those. Um, and nationally, that's a trend as well. And so uh, what CDBG programs are looking to do is just to try to, again, shift and, and figure out the best places to spend those dollars because they, there are requirements to spend those dollars over periods of time. And so with that, we found an opportunity in this particular case with the house uh, that we have mentioned here, 159 12th Street, Port Southeast, that potentially um, rehabilitating a, an existing home um, has, has some opportunity to spend our CDBG dollars. And so the proposal here, um, well, let me, let me just finish this thought. So, so we, we've done um, home purchases in the past. And we've done those potentially to, demol to demolish those homes and create, and that might have been fallen under the um, slums and blight category, um, or it might have fallen under um, just an expansion for new, air, for new projects. And so this is a similar type of request. So instead of purchasing the home to demolish, we purchase to, to rehab and turn it back into a viable um, single family home in a neighborhood that's uh, very stable minus this property. And so this area, this is the house in particular. Um, it's in an area of town on a Ford, so you can see the map. So this is the home right here. This is um, Main Avenue, Highland Avenue, uh, Tate Boulevard to the south, LR Boulevard. This is Hickory Chair. And so um, this is the neighborhood, and it's on a cul-de-sac that, that then has a number of other homes on it. And so this particular home um, originally was a habitat home, and so a family lived there, but the house became um, something that they could not afford over time and what, for whatever reason and we're not we're not here to really discuss that portion but it became a, a situation where the habitat took it over as a deed in lieu of foreclosure and so with that then the house then needs some repair it needs um, a new HVAC um, flooring materials um, had, there's some holes in the wall maybe some windows that need to be replaced and so some things need to be done to um, improve this property so that it can stay on the books as a, as a strong single family home in that nice neighborhood. And so part of the opportunity is for the city who needs to um, use those CDBG dollars for um, rehab to purchase that home from Habitat. That frees up some funds that Habitat can then go and make renovations on three or four other homes hit that slide to explain that a little more detail. And then what we would do is to contract out for the rehab of this home. You know, we're estimating approximately fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. And then that home then would be ready to sell and habitat and or the city we would just look for a family who would purchase this home. And so we anticipate that could take, you know, about a, about a year to do, all all being told. And so those, those are the details of the house itself. And so when that house sells, then we get program income that comes back to the, to the city then to help our, our program. And so you can see just the, there's not a garage on the home. There's a pull up um, into the driveway there, um, enter the front door. And that's the area. This is the neighborhood. On the driveway that we just saw is right there on the left, and um, and so really with that um, the request is for, to um, ask council for permission to move forward with a um, contract on the home and work through the program uh, for rehab of this one home, this one time where it makes sense to to use the CDBG dollars in this way, um, and then we can we'll be moving into a new fiscal year coming yeah, to you in a few short weeks through uh, budget um, information that uh, will be presented by the planning staff that 
is related to the fiscal year for the new CDBG dollars. And so with that, I'll just answer any questions if I can. You said it would be fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to rehab this. Roughly, it's what we you know we just got in general um, estimates done um, through Habitat, I believe, gave us some just pencil yeah. estimates about you know the things that I listed: the the HVAC, mm -hmm. the flooring, the walls, the windows. Um, um, Habitat has a rehab program, correct? They do rehab homes. Yes. yes. Then why are they not rehabbing this one versus right. asking the city? Well, I think in this case, um, there's an opportunity for us to cover the um, cost, which is a significant part of maybe a significant portion of their budget. We, we, it's a cash flow issue potentially for Habitat to be able to rehab more homes and not just one home if they can not have the burden of the, um, the, the cost of that home on their books. So if we took that, then they, they could still be rehabbed by the dollars that we have access to, they can rehab three or four other houses and then we're just that much further to the good. And what's the total available that we need to be spending on the CDBG funds? Well, our total budget comes in at about 340000 but it's broken into many pieces and that's what we'll cover very soon in April. So how do we go about selection of family because I know that they have a process. Do we turn that process over to them or do we? Um, we, could, we could or we could um, screen them ourselves and then we have a higher threshold for um, what's considered a low moderate. Our, our, and I could ask um, Mr. Leonetti to speak to that in detail, but as I understand it, more people could qualify under our definition than what maybe the habitat definition is. But we would work together. I think we'd just you know, make sure it was, um, the realtors knew it was available as potential purchase property, and we'd just work to find the right, the right people that fit that criteria. What's the tax value on that? Um, the tax value is 91000 that's what I was going to ask also. The, the difference between the trade value and the tax value, that, that seems to be significant. Well, right. I mean, it's, it is uh, tax value is determined by the assessor's office, Cobb County, uh, you know, it's tied to the last time it was appraised or, or assessed. And then you have um, appraised value, and it, it's a home that needs quite a bit of repair. Um, and so I'm not an expert on the difference. There, but well, it basically is it's the not last habitable. time they were inside the house. It, is, it was appraised at ninety-one thousand. So, if all so that work is needed to be done, yeah. then it's you know it's valued way under tax value. And, and this is the first for us doing this to purchase and, and rehab um, in this manner. Yes, for habitat. But we, we'd like to explore lots of options and in, in the future. And so and and. If, if those funds, if we don't use them, how long, I mean, they run out and we get them back, how does that work? Well, um, they, um, yeah, they, we would have to give them back at some point. But the, the goal really is to rehab houses. And so, um, you know, we've done, we've done a lot of the teardowns um, and, and working through the slum and white, but we'd like to, to rehab some as sort of a different approach. And so that's really the difference. But we, we don't have, I mean, we're particip we are an entitlement community that gets funds, and so um, that we want to be sure we're moving through our program efficiently and making sure we're spending those dollars. And so we have a, you know, a whole host of things that we'll be bringing to you after, um, in April. So, so all of this is new for us, it's not new. That's right. Good, good. I mean, cities well, do this. and It's not, I mean, Ms. Surratt said earlier, we've got, you have actually bought property through the CDBG program a number of times. Uh, almost yearly, we bought different properties, models into the small and white category. So that's not anything new. It's a little bit of a nuance is that we're going to buy it and then actually rehab it and put it back out on the market. We've bought them before and then partnered with Habitat to build a new home there. So, I mean, you, you do that as part of your as part of your affordable housing program, which we're mandated to do if we're going to be an entitlement community through HUD and through CDBG, which is a good thing. Uh, now, we going to carry we going to carry a note on that if we sell it. No, I mean they either get private financing through a bank, or if uh, they qualify through Habitat, they go back through Habitat's program. We don't envision ourselves uh, necessarily carrying the note on. Them. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank
But we have that program in place. We do. We do. We could be an option. That's what I was asking. I mean, we seem to be growing our CDBG funds, which is a good thing. I know a lot of cities, and I may be wrong, get it and they spend it, and it's gone. Yeah. We're not like that. We've been very That's a great point. That's a great point. Most of what your program has done is to invest in the market so that, you know, you've got a pretty decent collection rate. It's it has peaks and valleys, but you do ultimately get first-time home buyer's assistance back. I mean, they become liens against the property. It's not a burden to the property owner until they sell the property, etc. But it does create a revenue source. So you're exactly right. You're not just putting it into something and then it's gone. So you can only grow that program over 20 years to be pretty substantial. Looks like the other way to grow it some more to me. I don't see anything downside on it so. So, so we would have to, if, if we approve this, we would have to get a contractor to do the work that we would oversee just like we do if we own the house and we own the house. Yeah. Has anyone estimated, um, we've got an estimate of 15 to 20 thousand that seems like a lot of things that we need to do when we say realistic, or where did that figure come from? I think it came from Habitat. We just asked them what do you think it would cost to fix it up. And they do this a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I would be supportive. I think we've got a good um, CDBG project. <laughs> and uh, particularly, I mean, particularly to, to Alderman Seaver's point that, that ours is, uh, does have some mechanisms for, for funding from the thing um, as well. We've been able to leverage the money that has come from the federal government um, instead of just acting as a dispersing agent. And this is another opportunity to do that. It's just the next step for us. Absolutely. Any further discussion? I move approval. Uh, second. Motion by Mr. Bell, second by Mr. Seaver. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Here's your name, sir. All right. Next on our agenda is an appointment to the Board of Commission. Does anyone have any appointments? Uh, I'd like to appoint Ms. Swan to have you. The Public Art Commission. Rhonda Hale. Rhonda. Rhonda Hale. And I'm still looking for someone in Ward 3 to serve on the recycling committee. I mean, that's kind of how I and, and the same thing goes for Ward 4. And, and all the, the rest of the, the vacancies on our boards and commissions, I just remind everyone once again, uh, if you have an interest in any of these particular boards and commissions, be sure to contact us and let us know. Or if you have any neighbors that you think may uh, be interested in let us know. Usually about this time of year we get a list of uh, applications for those. So I feel we would find some folks on those who haven't been appointed and still seeking appointment. All right, we have an appointment by Mrs. Cox. Is there any other? Second. On Mrs. Ponder. Well, I move approval for it. Second. All right. Yes, sir. Motion made by Mrs. Fox, second by Mr. Meister. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. I'm curious. Um, are there any presentations or petitions or requests? Anyone have any matters not on the agenda? Folks, did you have something you'd like to say? Uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I would like to do a presentation to City Council. Uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I did not get my agenda packet <clears throat> until midday today and did not have time to scan it, so I did not know what was on it. And I hesitated uh, asking to be heard when the first presenter made his statements, but I have some concerns that I would like to voice the City Council about the decision that you have made to this point. Con specifically concerning? Concerning videotaping and airing your City Council meetings. Okay. Uh, Mr. Pope, I would, I would say that uh, we decided not to vote on that tonight and that we are, we are going to uh, hear from people individually as you have spoken and if you would like to speak with us that uh, at the, after this meeting we would all be available or any of us would be available that you would like to speak to concerning that 
well, not only tonight, but in the future. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I, I understand that and I appreciate that. But what I also know is that that's got to come back before council to be voted on a second time. And what I would like to do is express my opinions because one thing that you have said down the road the whole time that these issues have been, go been going on, transparency is supposed to be important to you council members, but it's, for me, it's though you do not want the general public to have two sides to maybe encourage them to give some input in the decision that you will be making at another city council meeting. So I would appreciate it greatly if y'all would allow me to be heard. Now before you change your agenda, council uh, uh, citizens were heard both at beginning and end. And I'm just asking, because of my disability and not knowing what was on the agenda, I think I should be given that opportunity. Okay, Mr. Pope. I'll ask you a motion by Mr. Seaver to allow it. Do you have a second? There is no second. Mr. Pope, I would invite you and encourage you to speak with any of us after this meeting or any time in the future. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I'll, send, right. I'll send my comments to the media. Yes, sir. Uh, are there any other general comments by members of city council, city manager, or the city attorney? Yes, I have. Um, I've picked up the paper. I don't know how many you see those server, but there's an article in today's paper about House Bill 150 which very much affects neighborhood conservation overlay districts and that very much affects uh, some of the long-range planning that we've gone through with uh, Claremont, West Hickory, Kenworth. Um, it, um, th this is a pretty serious bill that affects what local governments can do as far as design criteria and infill in older neighborhoods, uh, the neighborhoods relying on an overlay district for design consistency. All of those neighborhoods would lose their protection under this bill. This bill comes up Tuesday. And I would suggest, I would really like to suggest that staff if, if you do not understand this bill, could you get the council members the background so that we can let our representatives know for folks that have gone through hundreds of hours with Green Park, all these neighborhoods that have overlays, folks, this is huge. Uh, and that would take that out. And if you want to pull up, or I can leave this, uh, for copy. This was today's observer and it's an article because the Wake County mayors had held a press conference about this bill. It very much affects older neighborhoods and particularly ones with overlay districts. I'm not the expert to expand on this. Brian assured me he's been following this and he may can add to this, but Brian, I don't mean to put you on the spot. But this is, this is really important. Um, I, I, to that point, I, I'd seen that too, um, and what it essentially does is, I, I agree with you, it strips a lot of city, the city's authority to, um, within, within um, its municipal boundaries to set its own rules and policies. And I'd also like to suggest to council that there is a strong movement afoot um, down the General Assembly that, uh, that um, is really um, very anti-city, very, very anti-city. So uh, I think it's important that we stay close to our to our representatives, but I mean, we, we see that the General Assembly's trying to take over the Charlotte Airport, they're trying to get out, they're trying to take the Dorothy Dix property away from the city of Raleigh. They take an actual water system and turn it into an authority. So there's a very strong, Anti-sentiment seems seems to be in the, in the, in the same. Okay. Uh, 
Well, I understood from Dave when he mentioned that this excluded historic districts. Well, th that's great that they are going to exclude historic districts from this ban. But folks, we didn't choose to expand historic districts in Hickory. So we have a lot of great old homes in West Hickory, Green Park, parts of Claremont, parts of Kenworth that are in overlays. And so we completely lose control over people that live in these wonderful parts of town because some fella uh, from a new community that obviously just doesn't like regulation, uh, he, he probably hasn't got a clue about the neighborhoods that we have in Hickory. And how many hours some of us have spent going through long-range planning process to put these overlays in place. So, you know, I would urge each of you to get in touch with your representatives. Uh, I'm going to be following the paper. I, I don't know if this was in the paper before and I missed it, but this is a fairly big article on the press conference. I guess I've been so busy reading about the seizure of the Charlotte Airport, maybe I didn't realize this house bill was Uh, I'd just like to say this past Saturday, uh, the city celebrated on March 17th the 100th anniversary of the city manager council form of government. And uh, Mr. Barry gave a great account of our 100 year history. And uh, if you missed that, then I'm sure he can reiterate it. He, he practiced it for the third graders, and then I think he gave it to uh, maybe the Kwanis uh, or someone, and then went to the uh, Oh, we're to keep it on our level. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, he did, he did a tremendous job. And uh, I just want to take this opportunity to uh, let everyone know what a professional and what a uh, great city manager he had and, and thank him for this service. Any further comments? All right. Move to be adjourned. So we'll move second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.